Welcome, everyone. We'll get started here. Hopefully, this is working on Zoom. I'm manning the Zoom link, the Zoom chat. My name is Teresa Judd. I work here at Utah State Board of Education. So those of you on, on Zoom, feel free to chat. And I'm excited for our session. We'll start right here. So welcome. We have, oh, what's your name from the STEM Center? Yeah. That one. Uh, yeah. My name is Emmett Speed. I use they, he pronouns. My compatriot, who should be sitting here, his name is Clarence Ames. Uh, he ran off for a second, but should be coming back in just a moment to help me out here. Um, so go ahead. We'll turn the time over to you. Well, fantastic. Okay. Um, so hi, I'm Emmett Speed from the Utah STEM Action Center, and I'm going to be talking about our Milo and Friends program. So Milo stands for Math Introductions and Learning Opportunities. Um, the STEM Action Center as a whole, our whole goal as part of the state government under the Department of Cultural and Community Engagement is to make sure that parents, teachers, and community members have access to the best possible resources to teach STEM topics to their kids. So science, tech, engineering, and math. Unfortunately, math um, scares people. Math is scary, right? Um, and we're trying to make it be somewhat less scary. Uh, this is Clarence. Hi. Um, Clarence, to talk, you have to touch the microphone First, button. I'm trying to figure out how to lower this chair. <laughs> this is the front one. Way up in here. You don't want to feel like a little kid swinging your feet at the boardroom table? I feel like a little kid at this table because it's like the table's this high. I don't want my feet. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not a tall person. Okay. Deal with it. So everybody knows that you should be reading with young kids, right? So how early should you start reading with young kids? As soon as possible. As soon as possible, right? As soon as you've got kids, you should be reading with them. Or as soon as you encounter one in the wild. Right. <laughs> read, read to the child. Read to your feral children, yes. right? As soon as you encounter a child in the wild, read to them. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what doesn't occur to most families, I think, is that math matters too, because so many of us have some kind of math trauma. 93% of Americans have math anxiety um, at some level. So we are afraid of math as a culture. Everybody, statistically, is freaked out by math. And that carries over into the way that we talk to our kids about math too. But Kindergarten math entry scores are better predictors of third, fifth, and eighth grade math scores than any other variable. It also predicts, kindergarten math scores also predict third, fifth, and eighth grade reading scores. So your early math, the math that you're doing at home is predicting the reading that you're going to be able to do later. And if you care about reading, that means that you need to care about math a little bit too. So most people don't know this, but... Kindergarten math entry scores. Some of you stopped by the table and you may have already heard me preach about this. Um, kindergarten math entry scores predict future reading scores better than kindergarten reading entry scores. So that's significant. Oh, we said oh, that. Oh, look. Darn it. <laughs> the uh, next slide <laughs> says what I just said. Um... Kindergarten math entry scores are also really important for high school graduation and college entry and even how likely you are to earn a living wage as an adult. So if you can count, the first day of kindergarten is going to affect whether or not you can comfortably go out to a restaurant when you're a grown-up. So let's let's talk about things just for a second. Like, what are some things that people think of when you think of, like, what in a child's life is going to potentially impact their future success, right? Like, what are some variables that we commonly look at? Economics, yeah, right? Socioeconomic so status. So parent income. Yep, that's a big one. Anything else? Pop quiz. Parent, parent involvement. involvement. Yep, absolutely. Um, has anybody seen the data around parent education status and future outcomes. It's pretty significant, right? Um, behavior issues of the kid, usually pretty strong predictor. Disability status. 
that comes up. English language learner status, right? There's a lot of a lot of variables that we look at that are like pretty strong predictors of whether kids are going to be successful or not. So how do you think math from age zero to five compares in an, in a, how much impact is this going to have to all those other things that we just talked about? Do you think it's a blip on the radar? Do you think it's like, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) spoiler. Yeah. Spoiler. uh, Kindergarten math entry scores are more important than all of those other things. Kindergarten math entry scores track to future math scores, future reading scores, uh, high school graduation, dropout rates, college entrance, college graduation, career success, future income, like all of the things that we talked about, all of those predictive variables are less significant predictors of all of those desirable outcomes than kindergarten math entry scores. So let's ask this question. My first question when I found that out, because so a little bit of a backstory, I'd been the math guy at the STEM Action Center for like almost a decade when I ran into this research. Um, Maybe I should introduce myself. I'm the research and implementation manager at the STEM Action Center. That's a title that I made up. And it means to me that my job is to find problems and then try to fix the problems. So I dig in research all the time and I try to find gaps. And then sometimes I stumble on one that terrifies me. Um, So digging through the research and stumbled on this kindergarten math entry scores predict everything else. So this is math that's happening before kids get to school. So my next question as a researcher was, okay, well, sure. What predicts kindergarten math entry scores though? Because like maybe these kids are just coming from more supportive environments, right? Oh, we we talked about this a little bit. Um, We, we, uh, uh, we occluded to it. (laughs) Wait, are we, sorry. We're not, we're not there yet in our slides. So we're going to talk. Well, I know this is good. This is good. So this, we're still going to, before I jump onto that train. So we'll, we'll, we'll come back around to this. Uh, what predicts kindergarten math entry scores? Because I, you know, that's we're not where, there yet. that's where the train's going. So brace yourself, but let's talk about why it matters. Um, this is some fun data, uh, from Texas. Um, that I got at a conference six months ago, less than six months ago, two months ago. I don't know. Time. Um, this is so outcomes of students enrolled in high school for four years by the highest high school math that they took. Okay. So the highest math level fast forward, they graduated high school and that was the highest math they took in high school. 60% of those kids graduated with some sort of certificate. 60% of the kids who took the the highest math, the dark blue line, that top line. 60% of those highest math kids coming out of high school um, completed some sort of higher ed within six years. Of the kids who graduated high school who were below Algebra 2, um... 5% of those kids completed a six year, completed some sort of higher ed within six years. Why does that matter? You may ask. 12% of the kids who don't complete something higher ed within six years uh, end up making a living wage. So I'm going to go back here. This is where the math tracks. So Again, kindergarten math entry tracks directly to what math they're doing in high school. What math they're doing in high school. I'm going to make you some pudding turkey. Somebody's making some turkey. Um, what math they're doing in high school tracks directly to this. Questions? This feels ominous, but it's good news is coming. So um, at the STEM Action Center, 
one of the things that I do is try to, I mean, fix math. I've been on that quest for a while. Um, we evaluate the efficacy of math software, trying to figure out which maybe I should, I'll back up and not say that, no, not show that yet. Maybe you guys didn't see. Um, but we've been trying to do stuff to fix math education, to help math education for 10 years at the STEM Action Center and have a lot of data around positive impacts on things that we're doing. And uh, I was excited about that. We have software programs that are effective and a, a lot of other things. Um, and so that led me to wonder how we're doing as a state. Does anybody know? How did, it, did, it, did anybody see it in the graph? Did anybody not see it in the graph? Do you, does anybody know how Utah is doing compared to the rest of the nation? We're, we're, we're tied with Massachusetts we're for number, number one. one. Kate, did you see what, did you see what the percentage was? Right. Yeah. 35% so of our eighth graders are at proficiency in math. And that makes us number one in the nation. And I, so originally I went into the NAEP data and I saw this trend. Utah's data was like slowly creeping up. Like math scores were doing better and better and better over a decade. And I was like, that's encouraging. And then I saw that we were number one in the nation and I got really excited. And then I, but I was looking at raw scores, which are meaningless to me. So it was like 214 on NAEP. And I'm like, I don't know what 214 is. What does that mean? So then I dug into what that means. And it means we have 35% of kids reaching grade level proficiency. And when we're talking about eighth grade math, we're not talking about complex mathematics. We're talking about functional numeracy, right? So I went from really excited to really depressed really quickly. <laughs> um, and then I was like, well, shoot, maybe we need to figure something out here. Um, so here's my question. How early should we be doing math? We talked about how early we should be doing reading. How early should we be doing math? You want to give your spiel? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so this early. We should be doing math this early. Um, I hear so many people say, I'm not a math person. This is a thing that I have said in my life before as well. Like, I'm not a math person. I started feeling math anxiety around third grade when I started um, having those timed multiplication table quizzes. I was really bad at them, really slow. And oh, so obviously I'm just not good at math, right? And I carried that with me for basically the rest of my life up until a few years ago when I started grad school. Um, I am 99% of the way through my PhD in educational neuroscience at this point. So I study how kids' brains learn math. I just want to point out that yesterday he said he was 98% of the I way did more through. I did more. So yesterday, this is big afternoon. progress. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I really just have to finish my dissertation. And the, the closer that percentage inches, the better I'm feeling about it. Uh, if when I feel bad again next week, it'll be 90% again. Okay, cool. So just, the numbers mean nothing. Um, we're all math people. We are math people because we are people. Humans have developed to do math. That baby, that infant, that fetus up there is old enough to be able to discern magnitude in the womb. If you tap on a pregnant person's belly who is maybe not that fetus, but a fetus, um, on an eight month pregnant person's belly, you go tap, tap, tap on one side and tap, 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 tap on the other. You will get kicked on the side that has more taps. You can, you can tell how many or more, you can tell which side has more before you're even a person. A zebra fish can count. Zebra fish can do that. Coyotes can count. Bumblebees can count. But our capacity as humans to do more than that is what makes us people. It's not language. It's math. Infants, brand newborns, if you put a pile of, maybe newborns shouldn't be eating Cheerios, but if you put a pile of Cheerios in front of a young kid, a big pile here and a small pile here, they can tell which pile has more. And it develops from there. We are constantly learning and growing and doing math. And it's what makes us human. So, so then the question that I, uh, we're going to go back to my question, which was, 
okay, we come, we come prepared to do math. And then we get to kindergarten and some of us are doing well in math and some of us are not. Where, how does that happen? Where, 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 do, where's, what predicts how we do in math um, getting into kindergarten? Does anybody have any uh, hypotheses? No. Exposure. Where would exposure come from? Hmm. Home and preschool. Yeah. Yeah. So what the, the number one predictor of how kids are going to do is what the parents are doing, what the caregivers are doing. If the caregivers specifically, if the caregivers know they should be doing math with their kids. So I'm going to give an example here. Boys tend to come into kindergarten scoring higher than girls. Because as a society, when we play with boys, we say throw the ball harder and it'll go farther. We're talking about force and distance. We say that truck has really big tires. That's a tiny little car. So we're talking about bigger, smaller, right? Over, under, beside, heavy, light, countdown to start a race. We do all this number play and spatial reasoning play with boys and comparative play that we do a lot less of with girls. We're not like, that's a huge doll, right? Because that'd be weird. Um, and that creates this gap coming into kindergarten. So the fun thing where I think this gets exciting is if you talk to parents of two-year-old girls and you tell them that, spend 30 minutes with a parent of a two-year-old girl and say, hey, did you know that gap between boys and girls coming into kindergarten is completely eliminated? So I was like, oh, okay, that seems like a pretty straightforward thing to do. Um, oh, shoot. We're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. Uh, but yeah, so the, the, the thing that predicts whether they're going to do a good job or not is literally just if whether they anybody they should. should, then they should. Right. I was, I went to dinner with a friend of mine and I can't get off this soapbox. So I preach it everyone all the time. Um, especially if you have a child, brace yourself because... <laughs> I'm coming for you. Um, I was at a friend's house. We were having dinner. He's normal, just me kind of guy, right? Um, and I preached at him for a minute. And he was like, huh, I wonder how I'm doing. He had a four-year-old daughter, okay? And this is significant, again, because frame of reference a little bit. My son at the time was two and was fluent in the numbers one to 12. And his mom is a kindergarten teacher, and I know that that's not fair and it's cheating, but it illustrates that kids are capable. So I went to my friend's house, uh, similar kids to mine, similar person as me, but my wife knew that she's supposed to be doing this. I didn't, by the way. It was all her, so kudos to her um, for preparing my kids before I found this research. Um so my kids too, and, and fluent in the numbers one to 12, I preach at him for a minute and he goes, I wonder how I'm doing. And so we sat down at dinner that night and he tested his daughter. He said, Mercedes, I need you to take five bites of food before you can go jump on the trampoline. And her understanding of numbers capped out at two, we discovered. And he was like, oh, shoot. Huh? And it's not yeah. because he was really ill-intended. It was not, it was not because he had any ill intent at all. It was not because like he couldn't do it. It wasn't because he didn't know how to count to five, right? It wasn't because he didn't know the difference between near and far and big and small. He just, he internalized math drama in his own educational career. And his response when I first started talking to him was my kids can do math when they get to school. And that is the response of like 93% of parents when we talk to them, right? Is like, I'm going to punt this 
until my kids get into school. Now, let's talk about that for a second. What if a parent said in our society today, I'm going to punt language until my child is six? That sounds insane. It's like hard pass, guys. No, let's not. But people who have math trauma, which is, again, statistically, all of us, we think about math as the stuff that we're afraid of doing. So if you had a hard time with multiplication tables in third grade, like I did, or if you failed statistics class a lot in college, like I did, uh, that's the kind of math that you feel afraid of. So when we're like, what kind of math are you doing with your toddlers? You think, oh, I multiplication tables, statistics, trigonometry. Calculus. I can't do that with my kids. But that's not the kind of math that we need to be doing with reasons. Let me ask this question before we before we talk about math with toddlers. How many people in here, you're all preschool people, how many people feel 100% confident in your ability to do math with a two-year-old? This is that's that. See, that's yeah. that's a different response than I usually get, which is great. But y'all are also professionally <laughs> trained doing math with toddlers. Like that's your whole job. Uh, parents don't have that feeling. Like we get like in a crowd of a hundred, there might be one guy who's like, I got it. I'm fine. Right. That guy has an accounting degree. For, <laughs> like, and he's probably wrong, actually. He's, yeah. got, he's got an he's, accounting degree and he's like, yeah, I make my child do long division when they're two. Which is fine, actually. If your if your kid can do that, great, love it. More power to you. So, what does early math look like? Like I said, it's not calculus, it's not statistics, it's not multiplication tables. What is the math that we need to be doing with little kids actually look like? That Canadian flag, apparently. <laughs> okay. Parents so, made this yeah, slide. Yeah, I did make I did make this slide. So, and backstory. In case, have you introduced the Milo and Friends program? I said its name, yeah. You said its name, great. Um, Milo stands for Math Introductions and Learning Opportunities. And Milo is a moose because I'm Canadian and I do what I want. Um, so the leaves are on here. Uh, this I found some leaves and they were white on the back and red on the front and they were maple leaves and it, the nature forced my hand. So I made a flag. But the point of it, my son, when we would go on walks, when he was two, he just was obsessed with being outside. Uh, and he wanted to pick a leaf. Every time we walked past this one maple tree, he wanted to pick a leaf. And so I'd pick him up and let him grab a leaf. And uh, it was great. Uh, and then one day I was like, you know what? And I picked a leaf. He picked a really big leaf. And I was like, pick the smallest leaf I could find, right? And I was like, oh, interesting. Are these different? And he's like, yeah, those are very different. I'm like, I was like, which one's bigger? Which one's smaller? He's like, so we talked about that. And then that became the pattern. And we were doing that all the time. And then one day I picked, he picked a small leaf and I picked a big leaf. And he was like, mine's smaller. And I was like, yeah, yours is small and mine's big. And then I picked one halfway in between. And I was like, what's this? He was like, Oh shoot. I I don't know. Like what where what is that? And so we learned about the concept of medium, right? Um my kid, my son, again, and actually I didn't know when I found this research, first of all, I found all this research that said kindergarten math predicts everything, and parents doing math at home predicts kindergarten math. And as the fact that I had been the math guy at the STEM Action Center for nearly a decade and didn't know this was alarming. Uh, the fact that I had a two-year-old and had no idea how to do math with my two-year-old was alarming because I was like, uh, am I failing my child? Um, so I went home and I showed this research to my wife, again, who's a kindergarten teacher. And I was like, did you know the kindergarten math entry scores, the math that kids are doing between age zero to five predicts everything else? This is like, and the way that parents do math predicts that. She was like, I didn't know that. That's crazy. And I was like, well, how the heck do you do math with a two-year-old? And she was like, oh, let me show you. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. She busted up with a pack of fruit snacks because my son is food motivated, um, which is normal. Um, and 
I discovered that there is a ton of math in a pack of fruit snacks because my son, again, we're born math people, right? So he comes to this pack of fruit snacks, rips it open, falls on the table immediately without any prompts. He starts to sort them into categories, right? And so now he's got a pile of five grapefruit snacks and three strawberry fruit snacks and one peach because there's never enough peach fruit snacks in a pack of fruit snacks for some reason. Um, and so then my wife goes, how many fruit snacks? How many different kinds of fruit snacks do you have? It's like one, two, three, four, five. She's like, oh, which one has the, which one has the most? Which one has the least? Do you think you have more than 10 or less than 10 total? Oh, you just ate a grape one. You had four. Now how many do you have after you ate one, right? My daughter, uh, who is now about 18 months old, is a very different person than my son uh, and won't hold still or focus on anything for more than two seconds. Uh, she's delightful and wild. Um, and uh, the thing that holds her attention, the only thing that I've found that holds her attention for more than 10 seconds is when I'm warming up a bottle of milk for her, right? And when you're warming up a bottle of milk, you have 30 seconds on the clock, you could do a countdown. And so she doesn't talk yet, but as the clock is counting down and I'm saying the numbers out loud, she demands to be up on my hip and bleh, 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 right? As the, and looking at the numbers as we count down. So we're doing math. You use whatever the kid is interested in, whatever the kid is motivated by is the right thing to be doing when you're doing math at home. Which is where Milo and friends comes in. Um, we have throughout our, our program for the last two years, we've tried situated resources. So at Wheeler Farm, we put up these signs um, that have kind of math prompts. So one of these is uh, where can you see a circle? Do you think you can find some triangles nearby too? So while you're walking through Wheeler Farm with your young kid, you can be prompted to find some shapes in society, in the world around you. We also have a scavenger hunt at the Loveland Living, Plan Loveland Living Planet Aquarium. Um, we've been working with Tracy Aviary to get some math outside of their Kia exhibit. You know, the, the cute little fat giant green parrots. Um, we have, what else have we got? Uh, we're trying to do everything. We are trying to do honestly. everything. So we're in Tracy Aviary and um, we're creating a partnership with Rancho Markets. We're currently trying, we're working with Intermountain Healthcare and university healthcare to try to get into uh, the well check visits with math resources. Um, but like we're- That's spoilers though. Okay, sorry, spoilers. Um, <laughs> we're just trying, we're trying to do everything. We the, the goal is to get this information into the hands of every parent. Right. The main piece of this so far has been the board games. So if you've come by our table over in the main library, um, you've seen that we have some games on our table. Um, math board games are a fantastic way to break through parents' math trauma and get them engaging in math with their kids. And it doesn't have to be math board games. It just has to be board games. You can find math in almost any board game, really, we've found some that have a whole bunch of really on the surface math, though, that doesn't feel intimidating for parents. The one that's on the screen right now is Happy Bunny. That's our favorite. It's like if Candyland was worth its cardboard. So it, it it's functionally the same. You have your little path that you're walking, your little your little piece down. But on the square where you land, there is a number. So if you land on a blue square, it's got the number four. You have to pull one, two, three, four carrots out of the out of the box, and the carrots either have bites out of them or they don't. So there's sorting, and at the end of the game, 
the farmer who has the carrots without bites and the bunny who has the carrots with bites, whoever has more is the winner. So there's that counting again or magnitude comparison, or if you can't really count to 17 yet, you can make a nice long line and say who has a longer line of carrots. So there's ways to like meet your kid where they are while you're playing Happy Bunny. It's a fantastic game. Highly, highly recommend it. We have a whole bunch of other games though. And Fundamentally, we've been doing these outreach events with preschools, with families, with libraries, and giving these board games away because we want parents to be doing more math with young kids. And with board games, they don't feel like they're teaching math. You don't feel, you're not activating that trauma because you're just counting. You're just pulling cute little carrots out of a board game. It doesn't feel scary. One of the one of the important things that we are questing for, I, I don't know how many of you have had this experience, but parents will often they'll have that they'll they'll say, "I'm not a math person," or "I'm going to wait till my kids get to school for them to do math," or whatever. Like they, there's all these responses, right? And one of the important things that helps them get past that because they are, they're thinking about calculus or they're thinking trigonometry, whatever it is they're thinking about when they're thinking about doing math with their toddler. Um, one of the things that helps get past that is whether you have a board game or not, is giving them the opportunity to engage with their child in a math activity that shows the capability of that child and shows how easy it is and that it isn't, it isn't scary, right? Um, and if you can do that, whether that's with fruit snacks or with a board game or whatever, or with some leaves, right? And you get the kid engaged and the parent engaged and they're like, oh, then that mindset shifts. And that's what we're talking about. That shift in the brain of the parent is where the power lives. The reason that we landed on board games, how much time do we have? When are we done? I know where's the idea. 345. All right, we got so much time. So much time. So much time. All right, then I'm going to back up and explain this. So... This is important when it comes to board games. So I uh, have a neighbor who's a bigger nerd than me when it comes to board games, and that is a significant feat. Um, he has more than 500 games on his shelf that he hasn't even opened yet, uh, which is... Anyway, I, I'm not one to talk, but you know. Um, he recommended this game to me, this one in the bottom corner right here. It's called My First Orchard. And so I got it. Cause he was like, and my, and this was when my son was two and I was like, this is going to be fun. I'm going to play it with my kid. And I opened the box and my son was super stoked about it because he wanted to play a game with me. Uh, and so we opened the box and chaos exploded out of that box. He's picking up these big chunky wooden pieces of fruit and chucking them around the room and throwing the wooden, the cardboard discs, like they're Frisbees, right? Chaos it took me. 20, 30 minutes to find all the pieces and wrangle them back into the box. I shut the box and said, I'm never doing that again. And I put it on the shelf. And then the next day, Ren said, I don't want to play that game again. And I was like, oh, okay. And I got it down off the shelf. <clears throat> Same thing again. That happened every day for a week, multiple times a day. And this is key because I've read I read a research paper recently that said that kids can't do board games below the age of five. And there, I was like, pardon, what? And I looked at their methodology and their methodology was that first experience that I had with the board game where chaos exploded out of the box, which is normal and healthy, by the way. Like, so one of the things that is important to talk to parents about if you're, if you're playing board games is like, you don't have to follow the rules right out the gate. By the seventh time or eighth or 14th or whatever time we were playing this game, we actually got the game set up and made it through like two or three turns, right? And it was at that point that I was like, hold on. We're doing probability. Like I'm doing probability with a two-year-old right now. That's a junior high standard. Hmm. Okay. We should investigate this. So that's how we got onto board games. We wrote 
uh, I wrote a bunch of emails and made a bunch of phone calls to a bunch of companies and they sent us hundreds of board games. And then every Saturday at my house was all the neighbor kids playing board games so that we could figure out if they were good or not. We had the really traumatic experience of also having to just play a ton of math kid board games at work as yeah. well, which was, the lines got really blurry when you, when you're trying to fix math education for toddlers and you have a toddler, you're like, am I at work right now? Or am I like, what is going on? Anyway, math books. This one is actually your slide. Oh, okay. Well, pattern breakers, <laughs> there are math books. That's another way to engage with kids, right? So they're, reading obviously we're trying to get everybody to read with kids um you guys are trying to get everybody to read with kids all the time my son is a fascinating very narrative driven individual who at six months old would sit on my lap and read charles dickens uh like i was you know i'd be sitting there and i'd read out loud to him for four hours and he would just be focused which is insane and very not normal um, and he's still that kid. Like he is very, he wants to read a thousand books a day. And I laugh a little bit about the 20 minutes a day thing because I'm like, if that, that sounds nice, honestly. Um, but I couldn't get him to figure out patterns for all the wonderful math stuff that was going on in his life um, and bigger and smaller and fruit snacks and all that. I had tried patterning with him and he, it wasn't clicking. Uh, and I couldn't get it to click. And then I found this book called Pattern Breakers and <laughs> it's delightful. Um, and we read it and he loved it. And he wanted to read it five times a day for the first two weeks we had it. And now he is looking for patterns everywhere. And it's like two years later, by the way that he's still looking for patterns everywhere and obsessed with patterns and loves. And he's really, really good at patterning because I found something that he was interested in, which is stories and books and reading and narrative. And I was like, okay, I'm going to sneak in this concept, right? So again, about situating mathematics into whatever you're doing anyway, into whatever the kid is excelling at, into whatever, whatever they're excited about. Because guess what? Math is everywhere. That that shocks nobody. I talked about okay, that. We've already <laughs> talked about that. We're really bad at following. Spot It's a great game. Spot It's a really great game. We bought 15 different games that we bought a, just a bajillion copies of that we think are really, really fantastic. Um, we have this, the, the list of games is on our website. That's stem.utah.gov slash Milo. Um, or you can hunt Clarence and I down after this and shoot us an email and we'll hook you up with the list. We have, ah, whoa, what, okay. did you, what, what have you done? I guess that's the end of the slideshow. That's the end of the slideshow. All right. Uh, ah. uh, well, one of, the, one of the things that we're trying to do, oh, I'm just going to throw this out there. Okay, so um, <laughs> you are all much more qualified to be doing what I'm doing right now than I am, just so you know. Like everybody in here who was like, yeah, I'm totally confident teaching math to a two-year-old. That was, I wasn't two years ago, right? I like, I have been in the weeds reading research this entire time, trying to figure out the best ways to solve this problem. Heck, I learned stuff today from another session at this conference that I'm going to be incorporating going forward. So like you guys are more experts in this field than I am. So we're making a bunch of stuff up trying to solve a problem that exists. And if you have better ideas than me, please. We want them. We want them. Um, because like the goal, again, we need, we want to, if parents, whoa, my mic just did weird things. If parents need to know, then we need to access the parents and we need to tell them, right? That's the, that's the boiled down version. I want every parent, every caregiver in Utah to have this information. One of the ways 
I don't know, man. One of the ways that we can do that is through maybe giving some stuff stuff out at well checks. Maybe one of the ways we can do that is through partnering with Rancho Markets. I really would love to put signs up in playgrounds because my kids love to hang out at playgrounds, but everybody's told me no so far. Um, like I, I, I want signs on hiking trails. I want signs in grocery stores. I want, I want to do these. I want to partner with any community partner who wants to partner, whether it's a library or a used car dealership that wants to do an early learning math event or preschool, which some of you are more closely associated with. Um, if you want to do a, a early family event and bring in 50, 60 families and we come and show up and preach at them for a minute and hand out board games and show them how fun math is like, let's do that. Let's, let's figure out how to, make sure everybody knows that this is important in 19 in 1983 there was a ton of research that showed that early reading mattered and no one had done anything about it and there's uh lavar burton's mom was a teacher okay and she was like i'm really passionate about this lavar burton my son you have a platform and I need you to fix this problem in America. And so LeVar Burton was like, sure, man. And, and started now reading, we have Rainbow, reading Rainbow. Right. Fast forward, that caught the attention of a lot of people and drew some attention to the research behind early reading. And a children's hospital in Boston started an initiative called Reach Out and Read, which some people may have heard of, that is now responsible for getting books into well check visits. That started at a pediatric hospital in Boston, ended up getting picked up by the federal government. If you look at what children's literature looked like in the 70s, there were no, there were hardly any resources for parents and caregivers, right? If you look at children's literature now and the resources available for caregivers now for literacy, it's night and day. It's wonderful, right? That needs to happen for math. If math, predicts re if reading is so important and math predicts reading better than reading predicts reading action needs to be taken right now and we need pretty much anybody who's willing to be on board to be on board was that sermony a little but that it always is one of one of the key pieces for y'all though if you have access to a pile of preschool or kindergarten kids Perhaps you do. Um, and you want some board games to give out to your families. We have some. We'd love to give them to you. Uh, we would love to give every single one of your kids a free board game. Um, the only catch is that y'all have to have a party and give these board games out and talk to the parents about how important it is to do math with your kids. Because we can't come to every single preschool in the state and preach and give this speech to every family. Um, we, can, we can give, we've done this with several people. So I'll use the Granite Family Engagement Center as an example. We trained, they have 32 different centers uh, that are family engagement centers. And we trained their 32 people Basically on, by giving them this speech. I, I mean, yeah, kind of. Um, and then gave them some conversation cards and resources and different like, here's how you teach the game. Here's that, you know, that stuff. Um, and, and said, go forth. Good luck. Um, and they've had, they've, they've given out over, they've re reached over a thousand families just from that Granite Family Engagement Center. That is something as, as much as I would love to do personally, we're just two people right? and we have jobs that are actually, this is kind of just a side thing. So <laughs> one of the, the really important pieces of this with the, the Granite Family Engagement Center, though, is we did do data collection on this. We had surveys before the parents got the games and before they heard the speech and they got surveys after they had played the game with their families for a little while and heard the speech. And the really important part is that families statistically significantly felt much more confident in their own ability to do math with their young kids. And parents felt more confident in their own kids' ability to do math. Like,
just a quick conversation about how important it is to do math with your kids, that it's not calculus or multiplication tables, and that that was that a 30 minute interaction. It. Right. You can do it. Your kids can do it. It changed those parents' perspectives on their own abilities and their kids' abilities. And that's that's what we want is for those conversations to happen with all of the parents in Utah and for them to have the resources to be able to do this. So please shoot us an email, get some board games from us for your school, or, you know, if you feel like you're capable, get some board games on your own, whatever. Um, I'm not going to pressure you to email me and get my board games, but we do have a warehouse full of them and we need them to not be in our warehouse anymore. We need them to be in the hands of families that are going to use them and play them where they will be useful, right? Um, So please contact us. We'd love to get board games to your preschool, teach you how to run a family math engagement event and change the lives of some kids and make the world a better place. We we saw an interesting little, I'm going to bring this up because, you know, uh, just get Stop us. Yeah, yeah. Get your get your most enthusiastic people on board too, because like uh we saw some differences in the data coming out from different locations. We've done this at a few places. Uh and the the impacts were significant in all the places, but they were even more significant um when you had people who are really passionate about this and willing to just yell at everybody all the time about how important this is yeah that's that's nice. <laughs> so but i think like that's you guys you guys are passionate about early childhood education i think based on you know you came to a conference where about you it. are and i think you're passionate about family engagement based on the fact that you're in this session so i think you're the right people for this job plus you're more qualified than me or emmett technically so you're in. Any questions? Yeah, we got like 15 minutes to kill. What do you want to talk about? <laughs> yeah. yeah. She'd love to know some of those. Uh... Uh, if you shoot me an email, I'll give you the whole folder with all the PDFs. Oh, he asked um, if we could send those research articles. Um, I will, if you shoot me an email and you say, Hey, can I see some of that research? I will send you all of the PDFs. Right Right now. If you want a teaser, there's, if you go to stem.utah.gov slash Milo, wait, well, there's a a button on there that says research. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to give you the direct link and then I forgot it. So we're working on writing up like the official lit review for this and getting a paper and doing some grants and stuff. So right now I could just send you just the PDFs of like the research articles. One day I'll be able to send you a nice write up, a paper that I've written that says what all of those research articles say, but in a way that people can understand it. Yeah. Science papers, man. Science papers. That's we. I guess what qualifies us to be where we're at doing what we're doing is we're both super, super big nerds. Yeah. Um, so we are able to read research and quickly decipher it and then be like, oh, shoot. Mm-hmm. Right. Where a lot of it's written in incomprehensible language. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, go. So if we're thinking about maybe um, up to something more kind of interesting uh she asked since they work at the the school for the deaf and blind um if we if you want to have a, an, an event how can you do it you just email us yeah we would uh same, love to. same goes for literally anyone else right? right if you your families are predominantly spanish speaking if you've got uh, a ton of refugees at your school. If if you're an ice cream shop and you just happen to be passionate about early childhood education, you want to have a party, like, let's do it. Yeah, uh, we will have a math party anywhere that you invite us to show up to. Um, I took a whole bunch of board games just on like Monday down to like Montezuma Creek down into Navajo Nation, just passing out board games. I will drive the games. Just a casual five-hour drive. Just as far as I need to go. 
if it gets me out of behind my desk and like out in the world doing good, I'll take it. Yep. Other, other, what, let me ask this question. If, if there's what, what ideas do you guys have? Like, honestly, like, what would you do if you, if you stumbled into this data, which you just did, Congratulations. What what do you do next, right? Like, because we're just, literally again, we're just making stuff up here. I I see a I see a gap, and then I uh, found that no one else is trying to fix the gap, and so it was like, all right, I guess something's better than nothing. Here we go. Buckle up. I'm gonna push this wagon down a hill and chase after it, right? So like, yeah. Okay, I would love that, first of all, because I've talked to the hundreds and hundreds of preschool teachers and kindergarten teachers and ask them if they've heard any of this data, which by the way, I'm going to back up. This data is 30 years old. This isn't new information. This Some of it, some of it is like published in 1990. Some of it was published the in first, 2023. The first big like meta-analysis that says, oh my goodness, this is really significant is 1992, which is more than 30 years ago. Sorry if that rocks anyone's boat, the fact that that's more than 30 years ago. but But like... It's not new. And yet, when I, I've talked to thousands of kindergarten and preschool educators and said, did you know, nobody's heard any of this, which means we need LeVar Burton to start reading Rainbow for math, I think, because the same thing happened with literacy, right? Like the literacy research that has had such a tremendous impact on the lives of kids now, until 1979, the definition of literature, uh, the definition of literacy in education across a lot of America was still able to read a sentence, right? Think of where we've come from 1979. LeVar Burton started reading Rainbow in 83. The research is from the 60s. Like, why is there, sorry, I'm, that's, why is there such a gap? Why aren't we in, why isn't this information in preschool pre-service programs? Because if you know how to make that happen, we'd love to. Yeah. You know a guy? <laughs> cool. Cool. Uh, yeah, let's... Yeah. I mean... <laughs> let's do I, it. I need to send emails to all of the people at USU in the, like, pre-service teacher training. I need to go talk to the people on my dissertation committee and shout. Yeah, yeah just lots of shouting. <laughs> Hello, welcome to my dissertation defense. Before we get started with that, math. <laughs> I mean, that's what your dissertation is about. So it's not that far oh, off. His, it his is about math, but yeah. not about this. It's not about this, but it is about how kids' brains assimilate numbers, which is pretty neat. Right. I'll just do a sidebar. Yeah. Is there any... Yes. Oh, there's Let's so much. Let's okay. talk about that. You want so, to talk about that? So, yes. Um, she asked if there is research about uh, like interpersonal connection being better than apps. Yes. Yes, there absolutely is. On uh, 100%, it is yeah. in that big pile of folders that I can send to you. M some math apps can be really beneficial, but kids have to be very actively engaged and there have to be very specific qualities of that math app for them to work. And however, apps. however, watching Dora the Explorer has never taught anybody Spanish, right? Um, because there is this like, when Dora says like, hey, so now you say it. And then you say nothing. And, and then she, good job. That activates the dopamine receptors in your brain that say, oh, you did a thing. Good job. But you didn't do a darn thing. And so what but, happens when that happens is you actually dismiss that as completed. You check it off as completed. Right? So a lot of math TV programming, a lot of math apps actually have negative impacts. 
not all. There are some that are that are good. I was I really want to dig into the what is good and what isn't and what makes a difference because I was looking at uh, an analysis of some math related TV shows and Sesame Street ah. has some positive impact on math. And a, there are a lot of other TV shows that have negative impact on math. So what's different, right? Um, but yes, summary, even, even the ones that are doing some good, um, let me just bring in a different study for a second about human connection that I love to reference. Um, they took, this was older kids, but they took uh, 200 kids and they assigned them all AI tutoring, okay? And they told half of them that they were being tutored by AI. And they told half of them they were being tutored by a person. For the 50% of kids who believed they were being tutored by a person, their outcomes were better on every assessment across the entire subset of students. And nothing changed except that they thought someone showed up and cared. That's the only thing that shifted. You still put your kids in AI tutoring. <laughs> if you yeah. do put your kids in AI tutoring, tell them that they're being tutored by a person. Yes. Uh, in the back. It's okay. From Zoom. Have you heard of the C Have I heard of the C Perel math? C4L, Connect for Learning, Learning Curriculum. What's math first? Reading next. And works well in a play-based curriculum. Like you're repeating. I know, it is. I want the people on the internet to, to know. I and mean, the people on the internet can read the chat. Your, Your mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, yes, I have heard of that. I haven't looked into it nearly enough to be able to make any assessment about whether it's great or not. Uh, I am willing to look that up and find out. Hey, look, um, Jana just texted me the link because she's on the chat. God bless Jana. Hello. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Jana is our compatriot who's in uh, Cedar City and can't be with us here today, but is she's, she's the best. And the next one is. Okay. Can I please get the information. Fantastic. We would love to send all of that research. Please just send me an email and I will respond to it post haste with all of the research that I can give you. And if you want board games, also, please hit me up. <laughs> A C4L. I think Guadalupe School uses C4L. I might be wrong. Okay. Other, other, other ideas, other thoughts, other. Um, if you are jokes? here in person, we do have a ton more board games at our table over in the main library. So please, some, please come take some away, so we don't have to haul them all back to the STEM Action Center. Mm -hmm. We'd love to give you just like a pile of board games that you can I, take home with you. Please. We don't have any copies of Happy Bunny or Tiny Polka Dot, which are the best ones, because we gave them all away but we're going to work on that. We do have Flipover Frog and Alana's Animals, and they are delightful. Please come take some away from me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, don't tell them not to come. No, come. Um, yeah. Thanks, you guys. Thank you, internet people. Are Thank we, you for being here. Oh, we got one minute. I'm going to tell a joke. The math joke. Ready? <laughs> My math, a math teacher told me this in ninth grade. It's stuck, so... Uh, why does a chicken coop only have two doors? Hmm? Anybody? Anybody? If it had four doors, it would be a chicken <laughs> sedan. <laughs> That's terrible. It is really not good. You're welcome. Canceled. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How come I can't mute this? I don't know, man. Keep on hitting the mute button.